Hey everybody, this is Reagan Knope. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. You know, externally facing what the AG is most known for is Oregon's top cop. In other words, the person that's sort of setting the criminal law standard across the state. Each state agency is represented and consults with lawyers in the Department of Justice that are required to by law. So the, the power is, is vast and mostly invisible until it's done badly. Today, I interviewed a sixth generation Oregonian, Will Lathrop. He is running for attorney general as a Republican. He's a deputy district attorney, former deputy district attorney from Marion and Yamhill counties. He was chair of the Sex Offender Protocol Board and served on the Oregon District Attorney Association and Legislative Committee. He worked with the International Justice Mission, started that in 2015, um, and he basically with a bunch of uh, national governments and nonprofits worked with a team of 70 different people to prosecute child traffickers and rescue child slaves. We talk about that at the end of the episode. Um, he was graduated from Joseph High School, grew up in Malawa, then went to the University of Puget Sound and attended and got his uh, JD at Willamette uh, University College of Law. We talk about uh, running for attorney general, the job of the attorney general, um, whether politics has a place or not in the uh, attorney general's office, and then what kind of things that he would do and how he would tackle some of the top issues. Criminal justice reform, Measure 110, Measure 11, non-unanimous juries. We talk about it all. Um, so Will Lathrop uh, on the ballot as uh, currently the only Republican running for attorney general. We had a great conversation and uh, hope you enjoy this episode. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, it's Reagan Canope here with Will Lathrop running for Attorney General as a Republican. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be uh, here. So, Will, why are you running for um, Attorney General? Yeah, well, I guess it's never really been in my game plan to run for public office, but uh, in, with my background in prosecution and law enforcement, and particularly victim protection, Oregon's law and order and governance has gotten so bad that I feel duty bound to try to do something about it. That's great. Um, so a couple of things that um, people may not know about you. Um, you were a, a deputy district attorney in Marion and Yam Hill counties. So does the job of district attorney is, is that like small AG um, locally or is it different? How do those jobs compare between district attorney and attorney general? You know, each county has has a district attorney's office and it's in charge of mostly uh, criminal prosecution. There's child support and, and child dependency and other things that happen in the office. But the, the main thing is prosecution. And so, yeah, my first job was working in Yamhill County as a as a deputy district attorney. And then I was recruited away to go to Marion County, where I was a child sex abuse prosecutor for a long time. So um Working in in that field, there's there's quite a bit of crossover with the Department of Justice, which is under the Attorney General's office. Uh, one of those places is um, in online sexual exploitation of children, or ICAC, Internet Internet Child uh, Internet Crimes Against Children, which which is something I worked on. They have their own special divisions, but particularly every case. A lot of people don't know this, but every case locally um, in every district attorney in in, in in the state of Oregon 
if you win or successful in, in a trial or, or a, a defendant is convicted it, and it's appealed, the Department of Justice handles, exclusively handles the appeals, the appeals mm -hmm. both to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, which became very important when you when you talk about non-unanimous uh, jury verdicts. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So to help give people more of a foundation on this, um, what would you describe as the job is for the Oregon Attorney General? Uh, what are the, you know, the different things that their office does? You mentioned that district attorneys are mostly focused on prosecuting crime. That It sounds like the AG's office is probably a little bit more expansive. Can you, you know, get into those different roles? The AG's office is is quite expansive and it would, it would probably be quite boring to try to go through all of those things. The I think, you know, externally facing what the AG is is most known for is, is Oregon's top cop. In other words, the person that's sort of setting the criminal law standard across the state from county to county to municipality to municipality. But the um, you know the Attorney General's office does things like con uh, consumer protection. They write the titles in the the ballot measure. Um, they per they defend the state of Oregon in lawsuits. It's their employees. They investigate public corruption. Um, the attorney general's office uh, is sort of a check and balance against state agencies. They're, they, the, each state agency is represented and, and consults with uh, lawyers in the Department of Justice that are required to by law. Um, so the, the power is, is, is vast and, and mostly invisible until it's, until it's done badly, which mm -hmm. it's been done for a while now. Um trying to think about the best order to do this in i think we'll keep going in terms of like the roles uh and things you might handle as the attorney general and then i want to close out with a couple of key points in your bio that i thought were um you know you can talk about maybe how they are or aren't relevant to the job but i just i didn't want to leave without um touching on some of those things so let's go into um in terms of the job of the attorney general um well, the first one I think of is when most people hear about an attorney general in the news, it's um, a lot of times it's about a partisan related issue. So when there's a Republican president, all the Democrat attorneys general all sign on to lawsuits uh, for things they disagree with at the federal level. And then vice versa, when there's a Democrat president, a lot of Republican attorney general are the ones suing. Do you think that these types of lawsuits um, ever matter or are they just specifically trying to you know grab headlines and keep AGs in the news is there a role for that type of of thing in the attorney general's office maybe occasionally but it's it seems to um be an overt politicization of excuse me with that word of the attorney general's office which is not really what it's built for it's more of a judicial office and so um, I've I've noticed as of late more than ever our attorney general and our Department of Justice is really engaged in national issues and national issues that really have nothing to do with that particular office, which has been demoralizing because there's so many problems in Oregon. There's so many things going wrong, and and so many of them are under the control or at least the influence of the attorney general's office. So all of our all of our efforts are put into things that don't they matter, but that the attorney general has no influence over. Um, and the things that really matter and the attorney general can do something about, we're completely neglecting. What would be one or two of those key issues that you see as most important for the next attorney general to tackle in the state of Oregon? Organized crime and corruption. I mean, I don't, I don't care if you're Republican, unaffiliated Democrat or something else. Everybody is concerned across the state of Oregon with fentanyl crisis, um, addiction, crime, lack of accountability at every level, um, the corruption in, in local levels and statewide levels have just sort of been leaking out almost, you know, weekly, but if not monthly in the year of 2023. And these are issues that, that the federal government can't clean up for us. You know, Trump, Biden, whoever's elected as a, as a, as a president or, or it remains as a president, can't fix our crime problem in Oregon. The Oregon's top cop has to do that. And so when I'm elected as attorney general, that's what I'm going to be focused on is cleaning up crime and really leaning into drug trafficking and organized crime, human trafficking, drug tra trafficking, things that are starting to take over our state. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about some of the top issues that are 
criminal or law enforcement related. And you can tell me what you think the attorney general's role is for those and what you would do to address those, um, if anything. So I think something that comes up regularly uh, is criminal justice reform. But the question, I think, is always, what is the right approach? What is the wrong uh, approach? What's kind of your perspective when that kind of topic comes forward? You know, I'm nervous about it. it uh, reforming um, is such an ambiguous term. I, th I think that if you're doing if you're doing public justice and protecting victims and trying to protect people's rights and their safety well, you're constantly responding and refining. So, you, in a sense, you always should be reforming. You should always be looking at things that that aren't working or could work better. That would be more efficient. And and less um, and less costly in terms of human resources and and financial resources and and more fair, more equitable for everyone. But when I hear justice system reform, I hear people trying to do wholesale justice system change based on theory, um, and it feels in Oregon a lot like the trappings of a human experiment. Let's see what happens if. Let's see what happens if, and that human experiment has not been going well. Well, I'd say there's, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's a controversial statement. I um, Everywhere I speak, everywhere I go is in Portland last night, Salem this morning, Eastern Oregon last week, and everybody I talk to is frustrated with that human experiment that we're calling criminal justice system reform. Yeah, I'd say there's two big points that come up pretty often. And the one that's definitely at the top of everyone's mind is measure 110. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about your perspective? You know, how far would you roll it back? What do you think the proper place is for, uh, you know, the criminal versus the healthcare um, perspectives on dealing with drug use? Measure one ten is something that that uh, that makes my blood boil a little bit <laughs> because uh, everybody in the industry, everybody who 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 worked like I worked as a prosecutor, law enforcement, knew the truth of what was going to happen with one ten. Everyone knew that it was predicated on things that were not true. Nobody went to prison for for simple drug possession. That never happened. It was impossible. It couldn't happen by our our drug statutes and laws. We were told we were taking people out of prison and putting them in treatment. But everybody in the industry knows that the best, the most effective way, the best intervening force for people who are struggling with addiction, oftentimes, is to spend some time in jail or to go into treatment courts or to have treatment as a condition of their probation. And so when you have none of those mechanisms and none of those levers, we have empty, empty treatment facilities and we're now the number one addicted state in America. Measure 110 has, uh, again, is a, is a laughable, it'd be funny if it was funny, but it's a laughable uh, human experiment. And what's been very frustrating is to watch the rhetoric coming out of the legislature with the speaker of, of both the Senate and the House and other um, uh, prominent, political leaders in our state saying, we just need to give it more time, give it more time. Meanwhile, everybody, there's people all around that are dying, are, are overdosing, our kids are, are suffocating in the dysfunction of their parents' addiction, which is causing all kinds of other vulnerabilities. Um, and we're trying to give more time, more time for what? To see if the experiment will work. Um, Measure 110 has been has been an embarrassment for Oregon. It's made us the laughing stock of the United States, and it can't be repealed fast enough. As an attorney general, you're not a legislature. As an attorney general, you're not allowed to make new law. I'll, as attorney general, I'll swear to uphold the law. I'll take that oath, and I'll instruct my office to do that. But I'll certainly speak out um, loudly and boldly about Measure 110 and, and with the hopes, because it's now it's polling unpopular. It's an unpopular measure um, with the hope that the legislature uh, will quickly do the right thing. It will be referred back to the people. A new measure will come up or it will just be voted down in the next session. So your your perspective is there isn't much you can do in the attorney general's office to change uh, 110. You'll enforce current law and you would want to advocate for changing it because it's it's not working. Yeah, I mean, the, you have other things. So, so drug trafficking was, is, uh, is an organized crime. An organized crime by statute is... Mm -hmm is tied to the attorney general's office and drug trafficking is still illegal. People forget that. You can't just sell drugs in Oregon. That didn't sure. change. It's possessing small amounts. For some reason, um, the current attorney general, well, it's an obvious reason. She's 
she, she's on the Mount Rushmore of, of people responsible for the ballot measure 110 passing. Decriminalization is in her DNA. And so um, it, it makes sense that she's done nothing to respond to the huge wave of drug trafficking happening in our state. Uh, but that can still happen whether or not, so that can, those cases can still be prosecuted. The industry can still be hit and hit hard if you have an attorney general who wants to do that, um, and you don't need 110 to kick drug dealers out of our state. It just makes it a lot easier if it's not there. Uh, one thing you said um, that I wanted to drill down on, if you have any more detail, you said that um, there's potentially empty treatment facilities. One of the narratives that's happening at the state level and with the legislature making large investments in um, uh, behavioral, they're calling it behavioral health, it includes some drug treatment are there, you know, are you aware of treatment facilities that aren't, uh, that don't have patients or that don't have, uh, that have empty beds for patients um, for drugs? Because I think the problem, as it's been presented a lot at the state level, is there's no available beds for treatment. What What's your kind of understanding you know, of that? I hate to speak with any expertise. I've, uh, on one-on-one -on -one basis, I've met with people that have have told me this particular treatment or that particular treatment. But the, the reality is, Reagan, <laughs> you can build a million treatment facilities and have a million beds and people go there for a reason. They don't go there for no reason. They don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I've gotten high for so long, I'm going to go get clean. Even if they wanted to do that, there's an industry right now making a lot of money on them that's going to keep them from doing that. They're going to keep them high because that's how they make their money. And so there has to be an intervening force. Mm -hmm. um, psychologists are going to tell you, you know, there's more than just that, but just kind of simply, you have the four reasons why somebody goes to treatment. One is fear of the law or going to erase that. The second thing is uh, fear of loss of loved ones. Our current attorney general has really reduced um, parents uh, who are getting um, drug tested to get their kids back from dependency court. That one's kind of erased. Livelihood. We, we coddle people that are addicted so much um, with so many services, the livelihood uh, doesn't um, really matter. And then the last one is they say the liver, which is which is basically fear of death. And so mm. we're whittling away. And the number one is is for the law, like the, inter the intervening forces, I'm going to get in trouble with the law if I don't stop or I'm going to be in jail if I don't stop. And you take those things away and you act as if you just build treatment facilities and somehow magically people show up and, and it mm. solves problems. It's ignorant to to the reality um it's arrogant because i don't think people in the know are being consulted about those those kinds of policies and it and it's mirroring the simplistic and one-dimensional um response to homelessness that oregon has decided to take on generally we'll build more houses and then we won't have homeless people when all of the studies and data for decades have suggested that that is not true and has almost zero impact if you want to attack addiction if you want to attack homelessness if you want if you want to start cleaning up the streets of 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 Oregon it starts with drug trafficking and it and it and it and it starts with accountability when it comes to drug industry that's what's driving it all thank you that's uh super helpful so measure uh, 11 is the other one that comes up a lot every legislative session especially um sometimes there's attempts on the ballot measure 11 broadly is a set of mandatory minimums for um violent crimes in the state of Oregon yeah. We've made some small adjustments to it, but those require two thirds votes in the legislature. So they're kind of rare. What is generally is your thought on measure 11? Should we keep it? Should we change it? Um, you know, what what is your perspective on it? I think the measure 11, you know, again, you're always looking for refining what what's the right amount of time? What What is the data suggesting is good to reduce recidivism? Um I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's something that should be written in granite. But I'm supportive of Measure 11. Um, Measure 11 is, is some of the most equitable sentencing we have in Oregon. Because, let's say that you're, you're one race, ethnicity, one part of town, one city. You go to court. You're in front of a judge. He's like, I'm going to give you 50 years. And then the next person comes in and he's part of the country club and I'm going to give you five years. About Measure 11 just sort of ignores all of those things and said, if you commit these serious crimes, um, you're going to get virtually the, everybody's going to get virtually the same treatment. Um, and I think that's a good thing when it comes to equitable treatment and just treatment of the law. And most of the time I hear people carping about ballot Measure 11 and how it's unfair. And I, I, I tend to think to say like, so what do you think somebody convicted of raping a child should get? And what do you think somebody who's committed, convicted of murder, um, vehicular 
uh, or excuse, excuse me, assault one, uh, assault in the first degree, some of these really, really major crimes, and they find out what ballot measure 11 sentences, and a lot of times they think it's too low. So the attack on ballot measure 11 as a whole, as a framework, I, I think is is an attack on, on equity. It's, a, it's, attack on, on, it's an attack on justice. But I do think there's some, there's some, some, you know, you put a bunch of crimes in ballot measure 11, do all of them need to exist there? Could some of them come out of that? I think that's worth discussing. And then I'd say the last kind of hot topic um, in terms of uh, justice related issues in Oregon is non-unanimous juries. So the short version is in the Ramos decision in December, 2020, the Supreme Court said you cannot um, convict a criminal defendant with a non-unanimous um, jury. Louisiana and Oregon are the two states that are left doing that. Most other states, if they had been doing it, don't anymore. So two years later, the Oregon Supreme Court in 2022 rules in Watkins v. Ackley that you've got to retry every living um, criminal um, uh, that was tried under a non and, and convicted under a non-unanimous jury. So they've got to be retried. That means a lot of cases need to be reopened, need to be, you know, they have to go back and get the evidence. You know, there's challenges with um, changes in the DA's office with the people who oversaw the original trials not being there anymore. You know, what's your perspective on non-humanitarian juries? Is there anything the attorney general can do about, um, you know, these things? Well, I'm an, ex I'm an example of of one of the people that tried non-humanitarian uh, jury verdicts that's not there anymore. So, um yeah, let, let me give some background on that so in case your audience doesn't understand yeah. really how that works. So, and this is extremely common. Um, I might try a case, let's say, of, of a very long and, and um, drawn out child sex abuse case, which was very common for me. And the judge gives the jury, all 12 of them, he gives them an instruction before they go, they go back. They say, you do not need a unanimous jury to convict this person. You need 10 out of a possible 12. Once you have 10, you can leave the room and come back and end it. And so it's very common that people go back and they talk for a while and they take a vote and 10 say or 11 say, yeah, I think he's guilty. And one person says... I think they might be guilty, but I want to talk about this more, or I'm not sure. Um, and the other 10 or 11 say, we want to go back to work, sign this form and move on. And so we that that was a process that, that happened for decades and decades, long before I, I, I was a, a DA. So when you have a verdict that's 10 to 2 or 11 to 1, and now they're coming back, those might have actually been unanimous jury verdicts if we'd given them more, the jury more time to deliberate, more time to talk, but but they didn't come back that way. And that feels really unjust because because those things could be 12, 15 years old. The victims have put it behind them. They're drugged back into this thing. And maybe even the evidence is completely lost. And this person is going to go free as a violent uh, child abuser, violent sex offender, all because um what amounts to to largely a technicality so I, I think I think the whole process of it has been a has been a, a tough pill to swallow and a bit un, a bit unjust and I've been disappointed with the you know with the fervor or the professionalism or the aggressiveness of the Department of Justice in arguing that case in the first place that uh, that has landed us way where, where we're at, at today you know like garbage in garbage out if you don't argue a case well then you aren't likely to win and if you don't win it affects a whole lot of victims and it erases a, a ton of work by the state and a lot a lot a lot a lot of money put in and it releases a lot of dangerous people in the community so it was a sad event um, but it's over and as attorney general now the law is clear and that's the thing you have to like separate when you're separate from politics um from a judicial position like this is once the law has been it comes down. And once the law is clear, uh, as an attorney general, I'll instruct my my staff to follow it. And one thing I mean, think that not everyone understood about that, the Ramos decision said, stop unanimous juries, don't continue with them. Going they forward. weren't required. They weren't required to look back. The Supreme Court didn't require they could have, but they did not require them to look back. It's the Oregon yeah. Supreme Court that specifically made that that choice. And like you were saying, the attorney general's office is responsible for making um, that argument um, there because they are, as you said, they, you know, they take the appeals for cases like that all the way to the Supreme Court. 
typically it's the attorney general's office that's arguing in front of the um, right. Supreme Court. So, um, and they, they were not that they were not a, they didn't make effective arg arguments. And and you're right. And therefore, in Oregon, that ruling went backwards. So everybody who has already been convicted of non unanimous unanimous are they're they're getting trials de novo, which means a new. So one thing about your bio that really, uh, you know, I thought was super interesting and I wanted to just ask you about and kind of see um, how that experience was for you and if it's it gave you something um, to help you as you run for attorney general. Uh, with the support of the U.S. State Department, British government, German government and UNICEF, Will and his team of uh, 70 professionals at International Justice Mission prosecuted child traffickers and rescued child slaves from the fishing industry in Ghana. So that's, uh, I would say, a rare uh, background, a rare resume item. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and if that's going to help inform anything that you do at the Attorney General's office? Yeah, yeah, very much so. So, I mean, just specifically, specifically what we're doing is we're working with the Ghana, the Ghanaian government, um, the police institutions, the prosecution institutions, and the court and, and social services. They've had this really, really troublesome, troublesome um industry of child slavery or or modern day slavery so child trafficking where children are trafficked not only the fishing but also cocoa and a lot of the women are from Ghana are tra trafficked for sex and labor into the Middle East. And so we would work with the government and partner with them to find these children or find these women in the Middle East and, and rescue and put them back to a place of safety and then prosecute their masters and their traders. And one one thing that we do with this kind of interesting is we were it's like a kind of a player coach. So so we would go with the police. We would go. We have our lawyers would go with the prosecutors to court, and and um, our social workers would be with the social workers providing services to these children or or to these women that were rescued. And during that time, you're, you're gathering all the data about what's going well with the criminal justice system, but what's more importantly, what's actually going wrong. So we collect, we collect that data, and then I would use that um, to talk to the Supreme Court justice, the attorney general, the head of all police, um, and uh, even parliament about passing new laws, uh, creating new capacity building. So in, essentially, we'd use that data from the ground to build up the, the bones of the criminal justice system to be more responsive to the poor people of Ghana, be more responsive to the people that were kind of living under the thumb of violence. Did that answer the question, Reagan? I'm not totally sure. Yeah, no, that's uh, tremendous. So it sounds like you guys are going every step of the way. You're not just, you know, supporting them in the courtroom, um, but you're just working with local officials, showing them how to how to catch these guys, how to, you know, prosecute them and how to get services to the folks who you found that are victims of these crimes. So I yeah. mean, I think that that's, it sounds like that's something that here in the United States, we've developed quite a bit more than they have there. And so you're kind of bringing that background to them and your experience. Yeah, yeah, sort of, it, yeah. International Justice Mission, where I was working, has is um, has sort of a wealth of, of criminal justice uh, expertise. So, so people like myself, I, I work, there's also a woman that worked for me from Barbados, from Uganda, people from the UK, Australia, just sort of all over the world, you're sort of drawing on all of that knowledge to try to to try to um, build and strengthen uh, fledgling criminal justice systems. Well, this has uh, been a great conversation. Uh, where can people find you, learn more about you, and kind of follow your uh, campaign? Yeah, so my 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 website is willathrop.com. It's just willathrop.com. Uh, I'm kind of you know. I left my job at the end of December. I, I moved back from Ghana in December of 2022, and I've just been campaigning full time. And I will till November 5th of 2024 next year. So you'll see me out on the road probably mostly. But um, if any of your listeners or followers have um, people they think I should meet or events that they'd like me to be at or just want to support the campaign financially in any small way, um, just go to my website and you can either subscribe to our news newsletter, donate, there's a donate button there, or um, or there's a volunteer button as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you.